So, uh, good afternoon again. Um, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Reem Turkmani. I'm joining you from London. I'm the principal investigator of the research project uh, Legitimacy uh, and Citizenship in the Arab World. Uh, our project is based at the LSE and it's funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. We started a series of events uh, this year to celebrate the centenary of the first attempt to write a constitution in the Middle East. And in this series of events, we, it gives us a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Rahaf uh, al uh, uh today. Um, we are particularly grateful today for her have to be with us because uh, we were very close to canceling the event because she hasn't been well at all. And uh, we are not sure that she will be able to deliver uh, this event today. Uh, and until today, I was asking her whether she's sure she wants to really uh, join us. And she insisted that she she will. So. Um, Please bear with her if she's a bit slow. Uh, I think it's very courageous of her knowing what she had to go through to come and uh, join us today. So thank you so much, uh, Rahaf. Um, before I introduce uh, Rahaf, let me just uh, remind you of um, uh, our next event uh, next week. Um, which is uh, by uh, Zaid Al Ali, the Iraqi scholar and specialist in uh, constitution writing in Iraq and in the Arab world. He's going to talk about the role of uh, legitimate constitution building uh, uh, in promoting stability both in Iraq and Syria. So he's going to compare the two cases of Iraq and Syria, starting from uh, that first attempt that, that happened to, uh, 100 years ago, uh, and the king, King Faisal, who we shared both between Iraq and Syria, and what happened since then, and why in both countries until now we don't have a legitimate constitution that should be the tool that uh, you know promotes stability in both countries so uh, if you would like to join i'm going to put the details here in the chat box uh, and we would love to um uh, see you uh, with us uh, next week. So uh, back to uh, Rahaf. Uh, Rahaf is a lecturer at uh, Lancaster University. She is teaching a course on the political history of the Middle East. Um, beside the uh, uh, the topic she's going to talk about today, she has a very interesting list of research interests, including. Um, the ideological borrowing between European and Arab nationalism, the rise of nation state in the Middle East, the Syrian crisis, uh, militarism, and the construction of masculinity in the Arab world. She's also now working on her book titled Constructing the Nation, Masculinism and Gender Bias in Syrian Nationalism. Uh, we're very much looking forward to seeing the book uh, out, uh, Rahaf. And uh, I would like to join you all to listen to Dr. Rahaf Dogli talking about the securitization of religion as a tool of survival in the Syrian conflict. Rahaf will talk for about 25 minutes and then we'll open it for questions and answer. If you would like to speak your question, please, uh, on the right hand side of the screen, there is a uh, an icon of a, um, a, a hand, a raised hand, say speak. So please click on that and we will give you uh, the opportunity to speak your question. Otherwise, you can just type it and we will uh, read it to Rahaf. So uh, Rahaf, uh, it's over to you. I'm going to end my presentation here and um, give you the chance to <clears throat> yours. So Thank, you very much, Rima. Thank you very much, Rima, and everyone who is watch watching me today. And I'm really sorry if I, if I look a little bit slow or not my usual self when I'm presenting. But um, I am hopeful that once I start with the research, that all of the passion that will come back. Uh, well, um, um, and thanks again for hosting me and, and for uh, this introduction. And uh, and I think um, I'm so uh, I'm so I mean I'm so I mean it's amazing uh, this uh, this project that you are working on, and I'm also looking forward to other webinars uh, uh, for next weeks or in the coming weeks. Uh, my re this research or this presentation is is based on uh, an article that will be out in spring with Middle East 
journal. Um, also, pieces of this research has also already been out with, with another article uh, with British Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, Departing Secularism. So in these two articles, I've, I've focused uh, um, in my analysis on how the regime is been, has been using religion or Sunni Islam as a tool to survive or to build ideological support inside Syria. Um, I mean, this this kind of research, why I was uh, interested in this research, because most of the research that has been done uh, in the last couple of years is that focusing on the material forces, on the use of violence, on the use of uh, armies or the geopolitical rivalries in, in sustaining the regime's survival. However, what I am uh, doing is that actually analyzing or deconstructing the deconstructing the discursive analysis or the discursive uh, uh, rhetoric that the regime has been using to mobilize and manipulate uh, identities within Syria domestically rather than in, uh, I mean uh, geopolitically or or internationally now uh, to to start with, uh, with with a little bit of a background uh, about the research so I mean I mean it's it's almost known to most of uh, to most of us that the regime is always kind of relied on using certain strategies to impose its authority, which have often mostly relied on physical repression and non-democratic uh, co-options. However, in this research, I will examine some of the discursive rhetoric that has been used by President Bashar al-Assad during the Syrian war to build <laughs> ideological support among the populace. Um, I am more particularly using securitization theory, which is a, a, which will be the guiding framework in this analysis. Um, however, the theory is not employed in the typical sense of describing a legitimization of a newly expansive force against perceived enemies. So um, mostly like since uh, the inception of this theory, uh, by its founders, that it has almost been employed in non-democratic, in, in democratic regimes. How democratic regimes or democratic uh, states are using securitization to legitimize the use of violence against its citizens. However, in Syria, we all know that the use of violence has been ongoing for the last couple of uh, decades. So, but so, but, however, even with these non-democratic regimes or authoritarian regimes, they still focus or they still uh, uh, use this securitization rhetoric in order to justify uh, the use of violence because they need the ideological legitimation or the ideological uh, uh, legitimacy for uh, to, to maintain support and survival. So the perspectives of securitization theory will help to elucidate the novel ways in which the Syrian regime is discursively mobilizing support for long-standing policies in the context of an evolving conflict. So I focus on the increasing use of religious justification for the regime's use of force and how the religious rhetoric employed by Bashar al-Assad has helped to reconfigure the relationship between the regime and the Sunni ulama. So I show that since the start of the Syrian uprising in 2011, the official state discourse has increasingly emphasized effective dimensions between the state and the religious communities, thus uh, reshaping the way that the ulama are understood as political subjects. So I, I do focus on how there is a reconfiguration of, uh, of 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 how the ulama is constructed, uh, uh, ulama al din are constructed within uh, the 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 state uh, discourse. So I mean, just a background to the securitization theory in non-democratic regimes, and and also how uh, in in the last ten years most scholars have interpreted the Syrian crisis as a proxy war as a proxy war for geopolitical dominance, whether it's between Turkey, uh, U.S., Qatar, or so. Saudi Arabia, How, and also others have concerned themselves with the relations between the Syrian regimes and its citizens by focusing on the rules of material domination, patronage systems, uh, nationalist narratives in helping the regime to maintain its power. Of course, uh, regardless to say, I mean, the works like Lisa Widin, Salwa Ismail, and, and many others, uh, uh, I mean, are, are in this category. Uh, and also there are uh, recent forms of analysis that do not delve Significant, significantly into the growing emphasis on religious affiliation in Bashar al-Assad rhetoric. 
Um, another another kind of uh, angle uh, of res of academic research is taking also the debates about sectarianism as a contributing factor in the outbreak of regional violence. Uh, much of the analysis on this topic again tends to focus on the international picture of sectarian alliances rather than looking at the ways uh, in which religion has become tied to national security discourses as a means of consolidating power within the country. So now I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about sectarianism later on when I use the data, but sectarianism here is how sectarianization is being used by the regime to redefine national security within, within the country. So these interpretation consider the national security narratives in Syria as constructing a patriotic banner to unity to unify heterogeneous Syrian communities against external others. So because the regime are no, do know that we have a heterogeneous community, so they are now relying on this religious rhetor rhetoric to uh, to unify uh, uh, to unify the populace. So. Um, let me go to the other slides. So, I mean, why religion? Um, I will I will show that in the Syrian context. Uh, I mean, um, there has been so many analysis about the, the, as I said, the survival of the regime using so many angles. But there is very much little about how the regime has survived within Syria uh, by using religions, particularly in its discourse. So, um, I mean, one one of the elements of this analysis has been focused on this on the statement used by the state is that the survival of the nation has become linked with a specific concept of Islam, which must be secured through the repression of dissidents and, and believers. So we see in this kind of state uh, uh, rhetoric that the opponents or the oppositions are no longer only terrorists or opponents to the regime, but unbelievers, kafirs, apostates. So these are new, theologically, uh, uh, new theological terms used by Bashar al-Assad or a very um, well-known secular state in before 2011 does ring a bill that now religion has a, a, a kind of a, a determinant factor in, in, in regime survival. So uh, another thing is that uh, um, I want to say that se using secretization uh, is not new to, to 2011 particularly. For example, in 2000, I'm, I'm using an example how secretiz secretization has uh, happened, uh, happened before uh, 2011, which is in 2008 when the Syrian Ministry of Religious Endowments presented a set of ambitious reforms to purify Islamic thought from stains of Wahhabism and Takfirism. Um, despite these early moves to invoke ideological religious differences as means of securing the national identity, um, um, I aim to argue that this legitimiz uh, legitimization strategy, uh, strategy took a distinctly new and more severe turn after the outbreak of the uprisings. So as the violence of the conflict increased, Assad began to consistently emphasize religious arguments and to intervene uh, uh, the state with a concept of moder moderate Islam that was presented as a defining feature of the legitimate Syrian people. So we see in this, in the state's official discourse, in the official state discourse since 2011, that the regime has started to introduce a new form of permissible Islam or a new form of what define you as a Syrian is to be a believer. Uh, uh, um, and, and, and this is quite a new. Um, so this went beyond the previous ambivalent and wavering accommodation between state and various religious authorities, uh, um, which kind of, um, in, I mean, uh, in, included a direct involvement of the regime in doctrinal divisions. So, of course, religion, the relationship between religion and the state in Syria is not, uh, has not started in 2011. It has long relationship before, uh, uh, before, before that. Uh, before introducing the relationship between religion and, and the state uh, before 2011, uh, let me just define how I, I, I treat national security in, in, in my research. So this research diverges from the common interpretations of national security as the protection of the boundaries of a nation state from external military threat. 
Instead, I emphasize the aspects of securitization theory that focus on boundaries of inclusion and exclusion within the domestic society. So, uh, so here, the national the security the national security threat is not uh, presented on the borders but rather within society so this research postulates that since the start of the syrian war in 2011 the security rhetoric of the pathist regime has shifted focus on the internal dissident dissent and has promoted a new definition of the national enemy to emphasize citizens who oppose the regime so he in um, assad for example increasingly deployed religious rhetoric to distinguish between permissible threatening uh, permissible versus threatening force uh, 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 forms of islam uh, as related to the Id identity and survival of the syrian nation um I will I will I will use the three speeches for uh, in this in this research uh, and and from these speeches the re um, 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 particularly religious faith is being webinized and co-opted as a means to combat popular political dissidents uh, while also indi indirectly controlling the ulama who became integrated into the state discourse now, uh, so we are here before uh, uh, in front of a newly state-sponsored concept of what is the true religions as defined by the Ba'ath regime. Uh, uh, so by emphasizing the distinction between a permissible, legitimate national reformist Islam versus an accept uh, unacceptable and heretical dis um, dissident in uh, um, dissident religion, faith in Syria became an increasing part of the mythic architecture of the state and served the purposes of consolidating national identity by marginalizing dissidents and characterizing them as heretics. So this is a new, a new theological terms used by the state as heretics, uh, 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 kafirs, apostates, uh, and non-believers, uh, not to true Muslims. They are all used to kind of consolidate and, or, and reconfigure a new state identity that uh, homogenize uh, 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 the, the, the heterogeneous uh, communities or, or, or these kind of uh, the, the, the division between uh, loyalists and non-loyalists. So uh, it's debatable, of course, as to whether or not this secretization of the ulama was actually required for the survival of the regime. Given that between 2014 and 2019, military support from Russia and Iran provided the government with an overwhelming material advantage in the conflict, like most cover, uh, government actors. However, Assad seems to have been motivated by a desire to obtain not only domination, material domination, militaristic domination, but also ideological hegemony. So as in the case of most secretization discourses, it's not the reality of the material threat that took center stage, but rather the desire to impose a desired form of loyalist subjectivity onto the populace. Um, so um, uh, let me let me just to briefly say um, and, and confer and emphasize that this new state ulama relationship or state religion relationship is not a new as 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 mostly those who work on Syria know that prior to 2011, uh, um, I mean the relationship between the Baathist regime and the majority religion of Sunni Islam is, in, is, uh, in Syria lurched between actually animosity and co-optation. Um, well, however, uh, I mean, the war promoted an alternative and reconstructed modern, moderate Islam strongly, which is linked, made it, li made it as, uh, as more linked to the stability of the nation. Um, so, uh, so after 2011, uh, uh, there is always this kind of introduction of a reformist, of a revival of a new religion. Now, um, um, just let me briefly in, um, uh, say a few few points about how uh, the brief about the previous rule of religion in Syrian politics. So, for example, uh, in, in Hafez al-Assad era. Uh, he faced the criticism when he, he ascended to power in 1970, 1970. He faced the criticism due to the secular leaning nature of the party and the consolidation of the power in hands of the Alawite religious minority. And he tried to introduce uh, 
uh, in the constitution, he, he, he deleted from the constitution that the, the president uh, should be Muslim. Uh, and and he, this was faced with with lots of uh, of op opposition and a protest. And upon that, he deleted that. Um, so these tension burst into the open in 1973. Uh, as I said, when when the draft constitutions uh, did not include Islam as the the religion of the presidents. Uh, however, so Hafez al Assad after that, the main strategy of the regime over the following decades was to facilitate a monolithic non-sectarian version of Islam in schools, in the media, uh, thereby managing the state's relationship with the Sunni majority and helping to maintain the tenuous support to, uh, of mainstream Sunni leaders. Uh, among other gestures, Hafez al-Assad signaled support of Sufism by promoting and empowering the Sufi Sheikh Ahmed Kuftaru in his role as a Grand Mufti. Kuftaru was very popular and had a strong support among Damasc Damascus middle class. Uh, in the position of a Grand Mufti, he cooperated fully with the party's state institution, included, including the secret police, Mukhabarat. Uh, this kind of cooperation, uh, or, and the, or, or we can call it clientelism, uh, enabled Sufi religious leaders to spread their teachings in exchange for their unconditional support for the parties. And as and here I'm using my experience uh, as a teenager when I was in Syria, that the regime, while the regime benefited uh, from uh, co-opting Sufi, Sufi leaders, but we can actually uh, listen to Sufi leaders in their in close circles where they are they are post posting and very proud that they have uh, uh, these links with, with the regime. So it was two ways. Now under Bashar, he faced more or uh, uh, more of a destabilizing regional situation, uh, um, and so there is a, a kind of a change or a, a kind of um, a slight shift towards uh, using Islam under Bashar al-Assad when he he rose to power. Um, and of course, the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 2003, the assassination of the Lebanese uh, for uh, uh, Rafiq Hariri in 2005, and uh, and and like. Um, and there were significant strains on Syria's international and domestic hegemony. So he, uh, Bashar al-Assad increasingly began to go further than his father in leaning on religious rhetoric as a pillar to claim uh, legitimacy. Of course, Thomas Pire uh, mentioned this uh, in his uh, writings. Um, so despite the ongoing expansion of alliances between the state and the ulama, the period prior to the outbreak of the uprising in 2011 continued to see sig a significant degree of autonomy for religious leaders in Syria. So what I am arguing uh, uh, here is that while there was certain alliance between 2011 between the state and the religious institution. However, still the religious institution maintained its own autonomy. So still the Alama were capable in so many examples to criticize the regime, even though that this clientelism or this co-optation was uh, uh, quite established. What we see after 2011 is a complete domination and the blur of boundaries between the state and the religious institution. So here it's more of a, a new relig religionizing, religionize, religionizing, sorry, religionizing the state or, or more or less that the state is departing its secularism completely. So there is a new formulation in post 2011. In this new formulation, the state did not merely support or encourage particular religious outlook in a clientistic fashion, but rather securitized and started to uh, use uh, 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 um, discursive violence uh, uh, by securitizing its preferred interpretation of religion as an essential and integral uh, component of uh, the official national identity. So the post-2011 dynamic was no longer based on scenarios of accommodation or co-optation uh, in which various religious leaders could be understood as being with Assad or against Assad. Instead, in it introduced a new form of religious vocabulary that portrayed dissenters as hypocrites and false believers. So the turn toward a state-sponsored religious outlook uh, has been noted by, uh, of course, other scholars. Um, and so um, 
there has been more so the post 2011 witness the intensified state religious discourse uh, uh which is uh, more of a blurred uh, blurred the functional boundaries between the state and uh, religions so uh, the state official discourse uh, uh let me now uh, okay so what's become more important in the official discourse in after 2011 is that assyrian must be a pious believer uh, so, for example, in his speeches between 2011 till 2019, uh, he directed uh, in the speeches that he directed towards Sunni leaders within Syria, I said increasingly integrated the specific religious viewpoints into his concept of who deserve to be considered legitimate Syrians. So, for example, sometimes he would say legitimate Syrian is defined by being able to uh, have uh, to uh, to to fight or to be militaristic or to join the army in but in these speeches he con he concentrated on that legitimate syrian is being uh, 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 religious or being a believer so the confrontational and exclusionary rhetoric of being with me or against me has long been a staple of pathias discourse but as i will document here in assad's post 2011 speeches to the ulama this binary for the first First time incorporated a distinction between the loyalist citizens holding true, true religious view uh, um, versus the apostate, the kafir, other who spread the false religion. So, um, so in other words, Assad sought to securitize religion by linking specific doctrines directly to the national identity and portraying religious disagreement as a threat to the nation. Uh, of course, um, let me let me now uh, go. Now let's start with an example of the speech of 2014. So he started this speech with saying uh, by sectorizing the conflict. He started with the few words saying, "Okay, well, this is this is we are we are we have chosen the religious arena or the religious platform because our opposition." Uh, Sorry, the opposition chosen this platform. So in this speech, he was given during uh, the height, uh, I mean, uh, to give you a background, uh, the height of fighting in Aleppo. And it was focused mainly on encouraging uh, local religious leaders to provide ideological support to the regime. He did not waste time in starting at the very beginning of the speech that um, what he said, we can only fight, I'm, I'm sorry to my Syrian friends because I'm, I'm going to read his words, we can only fight sectarianism through true religion. So although at the time the military situation was already moving strongly towards the side of the loyalist forces, Assad is intensely, uh, intensely uh, concerned in this speech with establishing the regime's conceptual hegemony and legitimacy, which he grounds on the support of the ulama and the triumph of true religious beliefs. So uh, there are three main points in this, uh, for example, in this in this uh, uh, speech. First, portraying the Syrian conflicts in sectarian religious terms. So Assad has, has been using that this is a sectarian affront, this is a sectarian conflict, and it's only Olama who can uh, um, uh, 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 win this battle. So um, in a way, in a way, this is this is to say that it's no longer the responsibility of the state or of the regime to win this battle, but it is your responsibility. And this is where securitization uh, uh, comes. Uh, in, in, in one incident, for example, when he talked that the soldier who uh, uh, um, uh, fired at the, uh, uh, the Mithena or, or uh, the, the, in, in their resort, as, I, as far as I remember, he said it's not because he is a loyalist or uh, we don't blame him because he is a loyalist but he is an unbeliever so this is obviously trying to legitimize and justify that it's not the responsibility of the state but those even those secret apparatus who 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 who, who use violence or who who are who has committed atrocities are because they are non-believers uh, so he also he adopted a, a specific national inter national interpretation of islam and also secretize the, uh, the the issue of religious identity and belonging so become what, what becomes here is that loyalty is a religious duty Be, uh, becoming with assad is a religious duty is an islamic duty so he 
He rhetorically asks how the religious sector and the Ba'athist regime could both benefit from the crisis facing the nation. So thereby, the, he's always, it's no longer about that it's the state is separate from the religious institution, but rather they are uh, almost one. He asserts that this state religion partnership should be further intensified in response to the war since the conflict is sectarian in nature. And the, uh, the ultimate goal of the opposition is to fragment and destroy Islam. There are so many instances in this speech where he said that the, the goal is not Syria, but the goal, uh, the aim of these uh, uh, opposition is Islam itself. So uh, it's that um, uh, an important subtext in this speech is that it is a religious duty of the Allama to help resolve the conflict in the regime's favor and thereby prevent the fragmentation. Uh, of Islam. So there is a kind of a tendency to religionize uh, the conflict. Um, of course, I mean, for, for, for uh, um, an officially secular state as Syria, this is strikingly uh, uh, new. So we, we have a kind of a very emphasized secularist credentials before. However, this speech shows a rather tremendous shift in identifying the needs of the state with, uh, uh, to rely uh, on religion. So, for example, what is ha in one of his uh, speeches, he said, what is happening in Syria cannot be separated from what is happening in the broader Islamic and Arab uh, arena. In another uh, way of secretizing this ulama, he says that religious leaders who do not show loyalty to the regime are hypocrites and enemies of Islam. So it's no longer enemies of state, but enemies of Islam, thereby placing tremendous political pressure on the ulama and essentially eliminating any boundary between the state and religious sector. Um, one of the striking aspects of this rhetoric is the extent to which it overrides Assad's previous insistence on avoiding any mention of sectarian loyalties. So, uh, in, for example, in, in pre, um, um, uh, for, of course, we all know that before 2011, nobody in Syria would, would dare talk about his sectarian identity or what is his religious identity. Of course, this is due to the minority status of the Alawite regime and as part of the secularization agenda of the early Ba'athist party. So pre-2011 Syrian society enforced strong taboos against speaking openly of sectarian differences. For example, in, inter in an interview with Al Jazeera News on uh, in 2008, Assad said firmly that uh, talking about sectarianism was unacceptable in Syria and that there were laws enacted for the prosecution of anyone who inflames sectarian tension. After the outbreak of the uprising, however, this insistence on secularism, unity and the defense of minority groups was profoundly upstaged by the perceived need to secretize the religious uh, uh, belief. Now, in another, in another example, actually, I mean, this speech is very similar to the 2014 speech. However, there is a more or less of a, an implementation of the state policies. So, uh, uh, so for, so what is in you in this speech is that Assad moves beyond rhetorical appeals and threats, adding references to a variety of practical initiatives that the regime is putting into place to accomplish its security goals, vice versa, uh, uh, the, the, um, um, religion. Now, uh, one of the strategies that has been used officially is that the creation of a young ulama, which is a faceless religious front. So, uh, in 2017, he announced uh, he announced the establishment of a new state-led youth religious group, which later became known as the Young Ulama. Uh, the overt purpose of this national organization is to modernize. Uh, religious teaching and to uh, brutalization, uh, brutalization manadawa uh, in a way that reduces power of existing Sunni institution. So the group's creation will help promote religious patriotism and integrate these young lama with the state apparatus. Um, it's very important that members of the young of, of of the youth religious group will be legally asked asked tasked with spreading al-Islam al-Shami, as this is a term used by Bashar al-Assad, and carrying out security investigation related to ideological dissidents. Uh, 
of course i mean uh, uh, um, it's notable that during uh, the pre uh, 2000 era the Pathia state had actively prevented the establishment of representative body of religious scholars instead preferring to promote selected amiable leaders such as sheikh kuftar so previously previous to 2011 the regime has always fo focused on uh, prioritizing certain faiths uh, to represent the religious institutions. However, after 2011, they were more into creating a faceless front. Uh, uh, so the formation of the youth religious group is a major departure from the, this earlier policy, shifting from accommodations with notable, identifiable, and thus potentially threatening uh, religious loyalists to a more of a faceless and homogenized group of young immature scholars who are mobilized to endorse Assad's official rhetoric without questioning. Uh, so in a quick proximity, Assad also announces in this speech a formal religious ban on, a on a protesting against the state or showing disloyalty to the president by using religious discourse. Uh, and Quranic text. Uh, taking extreme measures, um, Assad emphasizes his view that the primary source of the national crisis is min misinterpretation of Islam, as I have mentioned before, in this way that like uh, the state is no longer responsible or the secret apparatus is no longer responsible of any of these atrocities, but rather it is uh, these uh, Sunni ulama are responsible for this because they failed to deliver their uh, Islamic message or the true Islamic message. So facing ri a rising tone of Islamic revivalism among opposition, he declares a need to nationalize religion and police the true face against fundamentalists and heretics. Uh, of course, because I mean, in every speech and in every official statement, Assad looked very uh, disappointed by uh, that a variety of older, extremely popular Sunni ulama such as Usama Rifai, Muhammad Ratib al Nabulsi, have turned against the regime. So he declared that we need. So, so the, he Assad declares a need for the youth religious group to indoctrinate uh, aspiring religious leader into the proper understanding of that faith. So, uh, so, so, of course, Bashar al-Assad is more introducing uh, the, the modernization of Sunni Islam. The creation of the youth religious group is associated with a rhetoric of modernizing Sunni institution. Uh, it's also um, this modernization is equated with breaking up with the autonomy and authority of the most distinguished members of Syrian religious hierarchy. So there is no longer hierarchies among uh, in the religious institutions. So there is more or less a homogenization, the face of religious leadership by pro pro promoting a cadre of unknown younger ulama. The power of these new religious scholars stems not so much from their popular rel religious prestige, but rather from their confirmation and recognition by state institutions. Of course, this will also allow Assad to pressure the young ulama to take part in state propaganda and to give religious endorsements to government decisions. It provides a practical vehicle for implementing the national uh, religious identity that Assad envisions, in which integration with the regimes becomes synonym with, become, with being a true believer uh, in Islam. Now, let me conclude. Uh, so while, while uh, the current research shows that that shows the intensive and persistent uh, efforts of the regime to secularize religion, as well as the complicity of many of the ulama in this effort. I have not examined the impact of Assad discourse at the level of popular uh, reactions and individual Syrians perceptions of religious faith. So without more ethnographic on the ground investigation, it would be inappropriate to speculate about the extent to which Assad's rhetoric has penetrated uh, uh, the public consciousness or altered perceptions of the regime's leg legitimacy, or for that matter, how the manipulation of religion in support of foreign criminals has altered popular perception of Islam. So it's not quite known if, if, if this kind of newly uh, uh, employed religious discourse has changed people believes in Islam, seeing how now like uh, there are popular lectures saying that the interpretation of Quran in light of Assad's, uh, uh, of Assad's statements, for example, there are so many lectures now in Damascus about this and in Aleppo. So it's not quite clear if people are now despising uh, or having uh, altered um, um, 
altered beliefs in, in religion itself. So researchers may, may also want to investigate the effects of asset co-optation of nominally progressive outlooks within Islam. Uh, and also, I, I did not mention this, but he's also within this kind of a process between 2014 and 2019, he's also promoting uh, uh, female leaders, uh, religious leaders. Finally, I would uh, say that future scholars will be in position to have a much better understanding of the long-term effects of Assad's efforts to secretize religion. Uh, of course, asking these questions, will this trajectory lead to a greater empowerment of certain religious factions, factions and a more intimate integration between uh, religion and state power, as has been, for example, in Iran? Are we uh, in the prospects of uh, the Iranization of the Syrian context? We don't know. Or, uh, or alternatively, will uh, the auto, um, uh, well, I mean, it will be more of a more constrained uh, religious sphere in which the clergy become subordinated to the state. Thank you very much. I've taken so much time. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rahaf. That was it was really great. That was very interesting, and uh, you know, you showed us with a very forensic examination of all the Assad speeches and uh, the discourse, how Syria gradually moved from what is presumably a secular state to a state where loyalty is a religious uh, duty. Um, we'll open the floor for questions and answer. Again, you can either type your question or you can just raise your hand uh, to speak and we'll uh, uh, you know, uh, join you in. Uh, to start with, uh, we have a question from um, Michaela Cerucci, who might have missed the first part, uh, she says, and she's asking, but weren't state religious schools existing already under Hafiz Assad? Uh, also, uh, it might have been said but as well, but uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, Islam reference was cited by uh, Bashar Assad during his uh, inauguration speech. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. Yeah, uh, do you want me to answer now or to collect? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I did not, I mean, this will, will show in my article that will be out in spring, of course. I mean, this is not the first time that uh, the, the Syrian regime has been using this or manipulating Islam. Uh, I said like there is this kind of relationship that lurched between co-optation, animosity and confrontation that has been long since the 1970s. Um, of course, he needs to use, uh, uh, I mean, certain Quranic verses um, in, in the inauguration in order to appease to the majority. But however, the shift or the striking shift after 2011 is the use of secretization and the claim that it is the response responsibility is that the failure to deliver uh, a true religious uh, narrative is the cause of this conflict. So this is the kind of shift. And also um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the end of the boundaries between state and religious institution, uh, uh, and also the departure of secularism. And, 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 I've, uh, there, and I wrote an article, it's, there was, um, there's already an article about how uh, I um, it's published two months ago about how the regime is has departed secularism by using these discourses. So there is a kind of striking shift going on since. Uh, but this is not to say uh, in my previous in the early slides, I kind of explained that this has been ongoing since 1970s. Great. Thank you. We have a question also from uh, Zafir Nahas. He's asking um, or he's saying securitization assumes uh, dedicating resources for a uh, uh, securitized sector. Do you agree that in Syria uh, it's a bit different, meaning that awqafs and religious institutions resources were dedicated for the regime in exchange for power? Uh, mm -hmm. And he has another question. Did securitization of religion focus on individual religious leaders or the institutions? Mm, okay. Thank you very much, Zafra. This is a very important question. Like, well, there is, I mean, and, and, and thanks to them, I, I have to, to thank the Middle East Journal uh, who reviewed the peer review. I don't know them, but they kind of asked me to rewrite, I mean, to rewrite, to rewrite the article five times and to, to include a section on how, the, I mean, almost the secretization theory has always been employed in non -demo uh, in democratic regimes. But in, in the Syrian context, it's, it's differently being used. Now, and, um, of course, 
what I'm trying to stress is that despite that we, we are in front of an authoritarian regime, still we should focus on how discourse justify the use of violence. Uh, now, in, in the second part of your question, uh, has the regime securitized uh, 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 certain leaders or institutions? In my opinion, after 2011, we don't have a kind of uh, a clear cut boundaries between the institution and the state. I think the whole institution has been secretized and the whole institution is in the sense of demolish, being demolished under the state hegemony, a complete state domination over, over the religious uh, institution. Um, and, 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 and also, as I said, the example of the youth Olama is this kind of a faceless front in order to prevent any kind of another face to go on the, uh, the, the the regime cannot risk for example someone like Napolsi or El Puti or any or Kuftaro to rise on uh, to, to be popular and to to be against them so I think this is a way of uh, secretization in terms of the institution itself Okay, thank you. There is another question actually also from Zafar saying uh, Syrian religious institutions, including informal education, has fed into extremism and enabled violence. Do you think this is a result of uh, securitization of religion? Uh, does he mean before 2011? Zafar, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, I think it's been the case before and after, right? So maybe, uh, I, mean, I mean, securitization has always been. I mean, I mean if we want to kind of the, the securitization has always been used by by authoritarian regimes, and and there is an article written by Nicola Pratt about the Egyptian case, which is an interesting case how uh, the 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 CC is using securitization. So it has been there. But now it is more more focused and concentrated and linked to national identity. So, but there is always this: why secularization has happened before 2011? But the regime has always maintained the secular, the official secularity of national belonging and identity. So, religion has been there, but we are not allowed to officially say that we are religious. Uh, so it was allowed by the regime, but it's not officially your national identity. What I'm saying is that now after 2011, that religion becomes or being a believer, uh, part of your national identity and part of maintaining national unity and survival for the regime. I, I like your questions, Zafar. Very, thank you very much. Now, uh, Mazen Gharib requested to speak. Uh, Mazen, uh, are you able to speak now? I approved you, so you should be able to. Let me double check again. Here we go. Um, Mazin, are you able to speak? You need to turn on your mic. Uh, in the meantime, I'll read you a question we have from um, Mata and Siufi. So the definition of security, uh, actually, Mazin, you're here. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Reem, for organizing th this, and uh, Rahaf, thank you so much for a very insightful and very interesting presentation. And I'm truly looking forward to read your article in the spring. Thank you very much, um, My question is, with, with regard to the to the uh, uh, last points that you were you were making, I I, I I agree with your categorization that there are two kind of forms of uh, ulama in in, in Syria. You have the state appointed ones, such as the Grand Mufti or the Minister of uh, religious endowments, and you have the marginally autonomous ones, uh, such as uh, Al Buti or Rifai or um, th these kind of ulama. And in my opinion, that these kind of marginally autonomous ones had a more credibility and a wider influence over the uh, kind of general population, mm -hmm. and uh, they had kind of a bargaining space even before 2011 mm -hmm. with regime. I mean, remember that Buti for instance, publicly criticized Bashar al-Assad in a number of occasions, and the regime made several concessions to al-Bouti, such as yeah, yeah. the reinstating of the expelled Niqabi women, for instance, in the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. In 2011, these kind of uh, ulama defected from the state and aligned with the opposition, mm -hmm. uh, which, as you said, kind of took... And the regime took this opportunity to empower the Ba'athist version of Islam. Okay. Uh, my question is that, would this kind of 
Ba'athist version of Islam and the, the reconfiguration of the religious institution in Syria, would it be deeply rooted with the mentality of the general population since you know, the, the most the influential ulama are not part of it? Or would it be mainly perceived as a top-down approach mm -hmm. that would fail in creating a, a long-term impact? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mazen. I think this is part of the, the... I mean, I read it in the conclusion that this is up to the anthropologists and to those i mean uh, that i mean and, and also i put it like if i go back to the slides uh um just let me like the, the last bit the, the last yeah in the conclusion i did say uh, i did say that okay it is up to the uh, i mean whether this will penetrate uh, the, uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the, the Syrian society, this is needs more of studies. Um, so I did say like in the conclusions, so to investigate the effects of this, of nominally progressive outlooks within Islam and also whether it has affected their, I mean, whether, it, I mean, really these kind of strategies or policies or the use of these young ulama will penetrate the Syrian societies or change their, uh, uh, change their um, perspective of Islam. I, I think since 2011 that if we look into the Syrian, uh, who is the most well-known religious leader now? I mean, I don't think the Syri the Damascenes or, or 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 the Syrian populace are really now. Um, it's 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 no no longer about having these very well known religious leaders that people follow uh, closely and with close eyes. So I think there is a shift, and uh, and and so and especially after the death of Ulputi. Uh, uh, but whether whether these young ulamas will impact or have an impact on the uh, um, the Syrian popular uh, populace or, or the Syrian people or the Syrian communities, it's uh, difficult for me to answer, uh, to answer the extent to which they are effective in changing people's policies or to, uh, people's uh, ideas or people's uh, beliefs. But I think it is something with indoctrination and uh, I'm not saying I'm specialist, or but I have read a lot of authoritarian uh, tools or authoritarian strategies. Indoctrinization, ideologization, homogenization, these tools are effective on long term to change the people's mind or to blur the people's mind into what is really true and what is constructed. And uh, it creates ambivalent um, uh, 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 not only religious faith, but also a national belonging, um, ambivalent national sentiment. So it, it might be effective on the long term, but if now with the corona and with the economic crisis, to what extent the Syrian communities care about uh, who is the preaching or not, this is uh, uh, for, for I'm, I don't know. But it's interesting and it's put in the conclusion that it is for future researchers to, to carry out this research. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Rahaf. Thank you, Mazin. Now we have about six questions. Uh, I'm gonna give, put two to you right now. There's one from Hala Ali who says, I can't help but notice that the rise of religion coincide with the fall of the cultural and artistic scene. Uh, as if to add um, in a, uh, in a way, to the seriousness of the state. Uh, what do you think uh, of the significance of this? Another question is uh, from Yuman Al Qaisi, who says, uh, "How do you think minor How do you think minorities have been weaponized uh, in this context, specifically post 2011, considering the sensitivities around sect and identity?" Uh, well, in, in, in regard to the first questions, I mean, uh, uh, what does she mean by the cultural artifacts? She means operas? Uh, what exactly? I mean, the scene in general, the artistic Yeah, scene. I mean, of course. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, uh, of course this might play, but I mean, the regime is, is, is using, uh, of course, it it, it 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 will play. I mean, part. I mean, an important part in that. I mean, it. Uh, but the religionizing uh, of the state or of the national identity is a top-down one. Uh, it still needs some time 
to be established and maintained and kind of integrated within one's sense of uh, believe or not believe, you know, it needs time. But uh, uh, but it it needs maybe another ten years or another five years to 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 be more established and 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 like. Uh, but um, of course, of course, I mean, yeah, this 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 play that the, the regime is only relying on on using religion to 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 manipulate or to mobilize uh, religious, uh, sorry, ideological support. Yeah, this play. Play, downplaying cultural parts is 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 uh, is is one way of uh, of fixating on the religious discourse. Um, the other question was on how the minority card. The minority card in these speeches between 2011 and 2019 was not really um, present, but rather uh, it was more about. Um, telling Ulama that you are responsible for for these atrocities and you are responsible for this conflict uh, because of your uh, bad uh, message because because you did not deliver the right message that's why we are here so the minority card was not played at this in these speeches uh, but of course of course the regime used the minority card to legitimize his use of violence in many in other instances. Okay, thank you. We have many more questions now coming. So we have a question from Miriam uh, Putik, who's saying, uh, uh, and by the way, everyone is thanking you for a very <laughs> wonderful presentation. Um, so uh, Miriam is saying, how was the state's cooptation and domination of religion institutions received by uh, opposition Islamist groups? Uh, do they engage uh, with these developments and their criticism of the regime? Would you say it added to their own legitimacy? And then I have two related questions um, about Turkey. So uh, one from Yorgi uh, um, Arneda, uh, he's saying, uh, it's possible to speak uh, that we are uh, in form of bureaucratization of Islam like Turkey or Morocco. Yeah. Often it has come to the final question he promises, where he says uh, Turkish Islam is weaved uh, with the national Turkish identity. Mm -hmm. Do relate to the similar approach in Syria despite the diversity uh, in Syria? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I might, I will give like a general answer to all of this. I don't have Ala ad din Musmat, but I mean, this is so interesting. Um, it's, we, we might be into, um, well, it was suggested to me that are we, are we into an Iranian case? now like or is it that the clergyman the clergyman becomes more subordinate to the state or are we more of like religionizing the state uh, completely i think religion or understanding how the regime has used religion in this course is important but i don't think uh, uh the regime needs religion more than legitimization and survival so let's not go into that they will turn into a more of uh, a Saudi, a Saudi Arabia. No, we are not turning into that uh, officially, but we are, but they are strategically using religion for survival on leg and legitimization. Now, uh, the, the other question was about um, what Turkey. Was Turkey. Turkey, um, uh, yes, yes. Now it's more about the use of faith that weaving the faith and that, okay, Islam is not about, so for example, in one of his speeches, um, in one of his speeches, he said, it's not about the praying, but it's about uh, uh, that being with uh, good morals. Uh, so yes, it's about like, um, uh, they are redefining uh, Islam uh, uh, by the state. Um, it is. It is. It is in these speeches, and I. I, um, I don't want to burn the article or kind of hot, but there is a lot of going on. How like there is um, a very big and thick uh, uh, document uh, published by uh, Ministry of, of Qaf called uh, Fuq al Azmi, where they kind of interpreted or uh, kind of redefined what is Islam and not Islam, uh, what is uh, more uh, to be, what is the morality, what is morality and what is morals. And, and, and the regime has always said that what we are in is a morality crisis. We are not in a war against opposition, but we are in a morality crisis. There is another question that was, was really important um, 
I think I um what was it? Um, there another opposition of Islam. The opposition, the opposition. The opposition is completely oblivion. And yeah. what like I mean, really, I mean they are not even engaging. And I think they should engage, but they are not engaging. Okay. Okay, we have final two questions. One from Matasim Siufi, who's saying, uh, do you see similarities with the case of Chechnya in terms of co-opting religious structures and ideas? Uh, another question from Zaki Mehshi, who's saying, what about the regime investments in the relation with Christian religious institutions, especially during the conflict? Uh, uh, is it based on coercion or uh, is it more of a mutual interest between the two actors to sustain uh, their authorities. Yeah, I will start with the Christian institutions. And I think the regime, uh, as any authoritarian regime, they will use cooptation and accommodation in, in order to, to maintain their security and to maintain the un unity. So of course, they, they, they will use everything. They will not focus only on Sunni Islam to maintain their stability. So they use everything. They use discourse, they use material forces, they use the geopolitical rivalries, they use uh, uh, everything. So. Oh, yes, of course, they will use that. Uh, what was the first question? Um, so we had one on the cr relationship with the Christian institution yeah, yeah, and yeah. the Chechnya and the similarities um, with yeah. Chechnya. Um, it's hard to draw. I mean, the, the Chechnya, I mean, maybe the Chechnya is more like now there, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I don't know. But I mean, there are some studies saying that what is happening in Idlib and HTS and uh, Jolani is more or less, or less like Chechnya, but not, I mean, no, I don't think there is departing, the departure of secularism, no test since 2011 from the official discourse. But I don't think the regime will make that blunt uh, 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 announcement that we are, uh, they will use religion as weaved into constructing a, a new national identity uh, to mobilize people to be, to, to, to support the regime. And that um, if you are a believer, then you are a loyalist. If you are a loyalist, then you are a believer. That's the kind of uh, new dynamic, uh, but not to, to let religion rule out the, rule the country. No, religion will be under uh, the regime's uh, base. Excellent. Uh, so I think that's it. No more questions. Uh, and Zafir, Zafir seemed to have also given up and given more questions. So thank you very much, uh, again, Raha. Uh, thank you for insisting in appearing today and speaking despite all what you went through with the last few days. And thank you all for joining us uh, and for very, very interesting questions. Uh, please sign up for our coming events, which I promise you is going to be very special and very interesting with Dr. Zaid Al Ali, um, who's going to draw lots of conclusion from the bitter Iraqi experience, especially with the uh, writing of the last mm -hmm. constitution, which he was uh, uh, kind of he joined and he watched and observed uh, the whole process throughout and will try to conclude some lessons for the ongoing Syrian experience. So thank you for being with us again. Uh, uh, hope to see you in uh, future events. This event has been recorded and it will be available soon uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reem. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for questions and thanks for watching me. And sorry if I was slow or uh, I don't know. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Oh, great. Thank you. Bye. Cheers.